thank you so much for having me here. I, I see our conversation is really important um, because it's a conversation about how you turn your ideas into reality. And I'm not going to claim to know everything. I'm going to claim to have studied some instances and share what I've learned and then hope that you can apply it to your unique circumstances. I want to focus around this recent research I've done summarized in the innovator's method. And perhaps the best way to start it off is maybe with a joke because uh, both small companies, individual entrepreneurs, and large companies are all wrestling with the problem of how do we innovate? What do we actually do? So I love this comic from Dilbert when the pointy haired boss comes in and says, we need to act more like a startup. And the engineer says, you mean I can wear whatever I want, work at home, and have a huge equity position in the company? And uh, the boss says, oh, I guess I didn't know what that meant. <laughs> and the challenge for many of us is we're not really sure what does it mean to act like a startup. And to illustrate that, let me maybe share a story with you and illustrate how even in a business school, we've struggled with what it means to act like a startup. So the story begins with Jen Hyman. She's an MBA student. She goes home for Thanksgiving to New York City, and she sees her younger sister struggling with the question of, what do I wear to this big wedding that I've been invited to? She's a very fash fashion conscious young woman, and you know she's worn the same outfit several times and doesn't want to appear in her Facebook photos in the same dress. I know, a big problem. We like to call these first world problems. Um, but nonetheless, causing some emotional distress. And, and Jen is sitting there and she says, well, wait a minute. Is there any way you could take designer dresses and combine them with a Netflix type business model? So instead of selling dresses, you rent the dresses, ship them by mail, and then when the, you know, the young woman is done, they ship it back by mail. And out of this idea was born, Rent the Runway, a, a service that rents fashion to, to women by mail with a Netflix type business model. Now ask yourself, if Jen had come to you after Thanksgiving break and asked for your advice about what to do next, what advice would you have given her? Now, five years ago, if she had come to most business school professors, they might have said, write a business plan. But that's not what she did. Instead, she refused to write a business plan and said, wait a minute, I have several really important untested guesses here. And so instead of writing the plan, let me see if I could find a way to test those assumptions as quickly as possible. In fact, specifically, her key questions were, is this really a problem worth solving? Are women motivated to rent a dress if they could get it for a tenth the price? And would they return it in good condition? And to test it, she did the cheapest and easiest thing she knew how to do, which was she went across the river to the undergraduate portion of Harvard campus. She set up a little pop-up kiosk, borrowed a bunch of dresses for women to try on for one of the big you know, uh, dance events, and observed that 35% of the women who came in to try on a dress rented one, and that you know, 96% returned, returned the dress in good condition. So surely now she's got a good business, right? Now it's time to write the business plan, maybe go raise a little bit of capital. She didn't do it. Instead, she said, you know, I have some other really important untested assumptions because, you know, I tested it in a situation where women could try on the dress. What if they could only see the dress? Could I develop an online solution? So she goes down south to Yale University for one of their big formal events, repeats the experiment, but this time women can only see the dresses. They can't try them on. She's able to borrow a few more dresses for this, and what she finds out is with a slightly larger selection of dresses, 55% of the women would rent the dress even if they couldn't try it on. They could only see it. And 100% of the women returned the dresses in good condition. I guess the Yaleys are just more cleanly. I don't know, you know. <laughs> so uh, 
But nonetheless, surely now it's time to raise money, hire a team, scale it up. Not quite. She ran another experiment in which she went down to New York City, and this time she took only pictures. And she showed those PDF pictures to a thousand women in her target market. And what she found out was, if they couldn't see and touch the dress, they could only see an image of it, 5% of the women rented the dress, and 98% returned it in good condition. She continued to run experiment after experiment like this until she'd resolved the key uncertainties. And the bottom line was a Netflix-type business model renting designer dresses to the roughly 10 mil million women in their target market. A little fun factoid, at Obama's second inauguration, 85% of the women were wearing Rent the Runway. Kind of fun. So, um, but the key here is, the puzzle is, she did something really different than we would have told her to do, or that many of us might have intuitively thought she should do. She rejected some of those, uh, those, those, those logic and, uh, logics and those advice that we might have given her, and so you have to ask what's going on. Why, why would she do that? And to answer this question, I want to propose to you that we actually live in an age of uncertainty. And, and let me paraphrase, the, uh, let, me, let me preface. An age of uncertainty creates challenges and it creates opportunities. But to give you a sense, technology and demand uncertainty, technology uncertainty being can we make it, and demand uncertainty being will people buy it, and I would add to this maybe business uncertainty, will somebody else come and try to crush me? All those factors have been, have been increasing. Traditional management is focused on problems of what I would call relative certainty. I have a little chart here that shows the S-curve of a new product growth or a new business growth. And traditional management is focused on that upper right corner. How do I capture value? The question of how I create value or innovate, which is a condition of high uncertainty, we didn't really wrestle with as much. We didn't really deal with that question as much. But when it came across the table, we thought, oh, we know how to solve that until we took a step back and said, how do you manage uncertainty, the uncertainty of innovation? This was the focus, uh, has been the focus of my research over the last 15 years. Um, I started uh, as the lead researcher on a project that turned into a book called The Innovator's DNA. Um, that research is incorporated in uh, the creation of Forbes' most innovative companies list. I then, as we talked about, went and did my PhD at Stanford University, where I got deeply ingrained with what has now become known as the Lean Startup Movement. I was also there when the design school was founded. And, and as I uh, have studied this question, I, I started to notice some interesting parallels. In this particular research project, we went out and asked the question, how is it that entrepreneurs or managers turn their ideas into reality? And we studied four groups of companies. I've listed three here. The fourth has failed. And I don't like to put the list of you know, failures up here. It's kind of mean. But we did look at established companies that started innovative and maintained it. This is a sample of those. These are the you know, ones you know, Amazon, Salesforce, Google, you know, these familiar ones. We also looked at established companies that had scaled up, lost their innovation capabilities, and then found a way to reignite it. And then thirdly, we looked at startup innovators, because they're really successful startups are good at managing uncertainty. That's the water that they swim in. And um, that was the first part of the research, saying, what are people doing? The second part was back to my story about noticing lean start, being part of the lean startup movement, but also seeing the design school be founded and saying, you know, there's a lot of similarities between these frameworks. They're not exactly the same, but they're similar. And as I began to explore my hypothesis, that we really don't know how to manage uncertainty that well. As I looked across different disciplines, I noticed that as uncertainty had risen in the world, 
that each discipline had, had created a framework to manage that. So in engineering, it was called design thinking. In entrepreneurship, it was called lean startup. In computer science, it was called agile software. In physics, it was called active learning. And there were all these frameworks out there. And I said, well, how do these frameworks fit together? So the second thing we did is we synthesized these to identify the common steps or maybe stages or elements. Um, and uh, we came up with what we call the, the innovator's method which I've summarized briefly here. Uh, it, it involves the state, the elements are an insight, problem, solution, and business model before you scale. And I've kind of mapped out here where these different disciplines, where their core strength is in informing these different elements. And as you can see, you know, some have strengths in one element and not in another. But the key point is they're all kind of trying to get at the same underlying thing. I mentioned our first research was about disruptive innovators, people who come up with lots of ideas, who have more surprises. And what is it about them? How do they get the insights? And is there anything that you and I could uh, adopt to get more insights? And we did come up with um, five things that these people, that characterize these people that we can actually learn and do. And I'll just summarize them very briefly. Probably the most important is this skill or cognitive activity of associating two things. So ask yourself, here's the first iPod and a combination lock. What's similar between these two things? And the answer is the, the spinning mechanism of the combo lock. And in fact, the engineers who designed this first iPod, they could have designed a forward back button, but they knew they had this challenge of how do we get through all this information, all these 1,000 songs in your pocket quickly, and you know, they're at the gym and they're saying, wait a minute, I can go through a lot of data really fast with this combination lock. So they, they borrowed that in. That's what Jen was doing when she put together designer dresses and Netflix. She was associating two different things. So um, innovators who come up with lots of ideas engage in this all the time. So the key cognitive skill that we observed in the research was to associate different things. That led to the generation of more ideas. But at the same time, you can't associate out of nothing. You need fuel for that process. So there were four behaviors that generated the fuels. And the four behaviors, I'll summarize quickly, were um, questioning. So why is it this way? Could we do it that way? So questions that challenge the status quo, questions that uh, impose constraints or eliminate constraints or ask how might we. So asking questions more frequently can provide the stimulus for association. In a similar sense, observing, getting out there and watching people, what they do, how they work, how they live, or just opening your eyes as you're going about your day is one of the things that these innovative people did to get more sparks. They also engaged in very simple, low-cost experiments. They were willing to try things. Oh, one of my favorite examples of this came from when Steve Jobs spoke at commencement while I was doing my graduate studies. And he talked about, after he had dropped out of Reed College, how he dropped into some calligraphy classes. And you know, from where he stood at that day, there was no sense about what calligraphy would have to do with wanting to change the world of technology. But when he talks about how when they were designing the Mac, everything he'd learned in that calligraphy class about proportional fonts and spacing came back to him, and they designed it into the Mac. And his point was, you have to experiment. You can't see today how to connect the dots in the future. But when you're at that future da date, looking backwards, you'll see how the dots connect. So the, the innovators were willing to try things, take things apart, learn about things, and as a result, had more fuel for association. And then the last skill was networking. And the thing I'll say about networking is this is different than going to, say, uh, uh, an event and trying to get to know people to get a job. Innovators in our study were not networking for resources and jobs. They were networking for ideas. 
If you're networking for resources and jobs, your goal is to go talk to people who are like you, who are in your industry, who have the power to give you a job or to help you in some way. If you're networking for ideas, your goal is to talk to people who are not like you, who are different and who see the world in a different way. So these five uh, behaviors were at the root of generating new ideas. So once you have the new idea, what do you do? Well, I'm going to emphasize the need to understand the problem first and what we call, uh, what Clay Christensen has called the job to be done. Um, because the key trap here at this stage, and I see almost everybody do it, is you get an idea and you immediately leap to the solution. In fact, um, research has shown that when you leap to the solution, about 75% of the time, these projects fail and have to return to the problem definition stage. And by problem definition stage, what I mean is that you had a, a, a clue about what to do, and then you went to investigate it. But if you leap to the solution, you'll distort your innovation. What we want to do is take a step back in the problem stage. When you, before, you saw a symptom of a potential opportunity. In this picture, this woman's touching her head. She's describing pain or blurriness of vision. In the problem stage, your goal is to get down to what is the root cause? What's really underneath it? In this case, you know, whether we diagnose it as a concussion or a stroke implies radically different solutions. And if we don't understand the root cause first, whatever solution we create will be poorly fit and you know, not do well as an innovation. So one of the best ways uh, to talk about this is in terms of what we call the job to be done. And the idea here is that customers don't go out to buy our products. They go out to or, or use our software. They, they, they have a job they're trying to do. So the classic example is people don't go to Home Depot because they want quarter inch drills. They go because what they want is quarter inch holes. And if you could find a way to deliver the quarter inch hole better than a drill, they would, they would buy that. So as an illustration here, I have two motorcycles. One is a Honda, one is a Harley. And um, I put these up here because Honda really challenged Harley Davidson. In fact, Harley was on the verge of failing because Hondas were cheaper, they were more well made, Harleys leaked oil, they were expensive, and Harley almost went out of business because Honda was challenging the job to be done. Well, maybe I'll take a step back. Jobs actually have three components, functional, emotional, and social. And Honda was doing the functional job of providing transportation better than Harley was until Harley discovered what the other elements of their job to be done were. So if we think about jobs to be done, there's a functional job, which is what most of us, most of us think about. Most of us think, you know, if you're designing something, you know, in, in the family history space, well, I need to find a better way for them to get at their family history. But we often forget the social and emotional components. And in this case, Harley rediscovered the social component. I have a picture here of the hog group. It's the Harley owners group. This is where people connect to each other. You know, when you ride a motorcycle, you ride a certain type of motorcycle and somebody else is coming down the street riding that same kind, they'll give you the little secret signal, the little secret, you know, yeah, you know, hand wave. If you're not, you know, you don't get it, you know. So they, they, they tapped into the social element of Harley and into the emotional element, the, not just the coolness that this is an American brand, it has a ruggedness to it. And that revived Harley. And, and this idea of job to be done applies deeply to your innovations. I'll give you an example of my own students. They came to me about two years ago and said, we know a big problem we need to solve. About 800,000 children a year go missing. And that doesn't include <clears throat> those of you who are parents have had this experience. You're talking to a friend. You're doing something innocuous. And suddenly, your child has wandered off. And you're terrified. My youngest daughter wandered away so much, we had to build a fence around our yard because she was like driven to run to the street. 
And this is a terrible feeling. So they said, well, we know how to solve this job. The way we're going to solve it is we are going to make a child leash. And instead of it being this goofy little monkey, we'll make really cool designer child leashes and we'll sh you know, manufacture them in some low cost manufacturing company and do a better job of marketing. And I said, whoa, 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 OK. Good start, guys. But let's take a moment. I want you to go observe parents and talk to parents and try to understand the social and emotional components. So when they did, they found out some interesting things. Although the leash does the functional job very well, parents feel like they're bad parents. So it does a, it does a negative emotional job, and, 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 and maybe just as bad in terms of the social job, it makes them embarrassed uh, because they feel like other parents are judging them. So they could see from this that if they had gone down this path with the solution, they would not do very well. Fortunately, they went back and rethought, well, how could we do the functional job and maybe turn that emotion into a positive? And what they came up with, and this is something they're doing right now, it's called the Kai Band. The child wears a little bracelet with a Bluetooth signal in it. The parent has their smartphone, and the parent can set a perimeter, you know, 10 feet, 15 feet, and it warns the parent if the child wanders outside the perimeter. And the nice thing is it does the functional job and it flips the emotional job on its head. Now parents are starting to feel secure and in control. And they've won several competitions and they're advancing this today. But the point is if you understand the job to be done through that deep observation of your customer, you're much more likely to build a solution that can be successful. Once you have that deep understanding, it, you, you do want to match a solution to that need. And the big takeaway we, we have for this element, we jokingly call, uh, not jokingly, we honestly call it the minimum awesome product. And uh, some of you have heard of the minimum viable product. And, and uh, some of you have heard of prototypes. And uh, in many ways, uh, these are all really relevant things. The trap we're trying to avoid is building full featured products before you've tested them with customers. We all know of these, right? For example, there's the Segway. You know, before it was launched on the market, they built this incredible device. And once it was launched and they released it, they realized, oh my gosh, nobody really wants this. <laughs> Same thing with Webvan. You know, they spent a billion dollars before they understood that customers would order less frequently online than they expected, and that delivering ice cream in New York City at 5 p.m. in the summer is actually really expensive and difficult. Those were important assumptions that they hadn't tested first. They built the full solution before they tested it. So our goal is to get our solution in contact with customers as soon as possible, because that's where the learning occurs. In Lean Startup, we talk about it as this build, measure, learn loop. And if we can move through that loop faster, we learn better. One of the tools to do this is a prototype. David uh, Kelly, founder of IDEO, said, if a picture is worth a 1,000 words, a prototype is worth a million. Now, we have a lot of words for prototypes, ironically. Uh, there's, uh, you know, there's comps, designs, roughs, trials, blueprints, visuals. There's a lot of different forms of prototypes. And you might say, well, Nathan, what do you mean prototype? Because sometimes when I talk to established companies, they say, oh, yeah, we prototype. It usually takes us about a year. I'm like, oh, my gosh, guys, no, 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 no. That's not what we're talking about. And as we studied these, we realized there were essentially four kinds of prototypes that the successful innovators used in, a, in an order. There was the uh, theoretical prototype, which literally means theoretical, nothing exists. It was like a mental parking spot. Because what we do tend to do as innovators is we get one idea and we lock onto it. Instead, successful innovators said, great, that sounds like a great idea. Let me park it in the mental parking spot before I've wasted any time or effort on it. And then, let me see if I can come up with another solution. 
and fill up the parking lot with theoretical prototypes that are essentially costless. I love the abbreviation for it. It's TP. It's cheap, and you can throw it away. So uh, after you've gone through and generated a bunch of these theoretical prototypes where you're trying to go broad, you're trying to search broadly, then you can begin to start narrowing down. And one of the best tools for this is the virtual prototype. Sometimes it's being called the pretendotype, where you're faking it. And some of my favorite examples of this are Jeff Hawkins, who was the inventor of the Palm Pilot. Before he built that, he would carry a block of wood around in his pocket. And somebody would come and say, hey, you want to go to lunch? He'd be like, great. And he'd pull out this block of wood with some paper tape to it, pretend like he was using it. You know, he was learning things from that. Or um, another startup called Aardvark that did social search. So you said, you know, I'm looking for a good mover or a good pizza place, and it would send the question out to your social network to answer. Well, that is a pretty technically complex piece of software to build. Well, before building it, they just faked it to see if anybody cared. So they literally would send requests out to people on uh, Amazon's Mechanical Turk and fake as if they had created this social search software just to try to understand do people care? What do they want in the solution before they actually build it? So the virtual prototype could be a sketch. It could be a PowerPoint. It could be a video. But it's a way you're going to test your key assumptions. Once you've done that, now you're ready to go even a little more narrow and invest a little bit more in what has commonly been called the minimum viable prototype. And the minimum viable prototype, product, call it whatever you want, the spirit of this was what is the minimum that you could use with customers to learn from them. And um, the important words, the, the reason why minimum is important is because we all tend to want to throw a lot of stuff, a lot of features into our software or our product in hopes that as many people as possible like it. But remember that job to be done I just talked about? Well, it's hard to satisfy every job to be done at once. And it's hard to make everybody happy at once. In fact, that old axiom, you can't make everybody happy, actually kind of holds true. You have to start by making one group of people really happy, and then you can expand from there. And so the minimum aspect is saying, well, what is the one thing or the two things that I have to build here that will really solve that job to be done? And let me worry about all that other fun stuff I'd love to do in version 2.0. And um, using this minimum viable prototype, then you can develop what finally we call the minimum awesome product. And we call it that because, as one of our executives said to us, he said, you know, minimum viable prototype is great, but you don't want to be minimum in the dimension that matters in the end. You want to be awesome. And what he was emphasizing is both that discipline and focus only working on the things that matter most, but yet at the same time, making those that, so that they satisfy the job to be done so well that people say, that's, that's awesome. People dread doing taxes, especially simple filers. If you have one job, you only have one uh, you know, W2, W4 form. Even I forget. Um, and uh, the, what they did is they really got deep with people. So this is Intuit. And they do TurboTax. So they do tax software. But this whole group of simple filers don't use their software. And so they went and they sat down. And they observed these people. And they talked to them. And they said, well, what, what's going on for you? And what they found is that the simple filers, they felt really anxious and nervous about taxes. They felt confused by the terminology. The terminology made them feel incapable. And, and they just, it was so, such a horrible event. The last thing they wanted to do was buy this expensive, complicated software package and try to master it. They just wanted the problem to go away. So the Intuit team said, well, how could we solve this job to be done in the simplest way possible? And their first prototype was you take a picture with your existing camera of your W-2. Then um, you upload that picture to you know, the internet, using your laptop, and just grabbing some software they borrowed, it would scan this information into a pre-filled form and say, great, your taxes are in progress. 
And the feedback they got from this prototype was like, wow, this was way better than the, the, the way I used to do it. But it's also kind of complicated to have to take a picture and upload it. And usually simple filers weren't that technically sophisticated anyway. They said, why do I have to have all this stuff? Why couldn't I just take a picture on my phone? The team is like, oh my gosh, why couldn't you? What a great idea. So the next prototype was they took the, they, you download a free app. You answer questions such as what's your name, social security number, date of birth. You take a snap of, you snap a photo of your W-2. It uploads it, and then it allows you to e-file. Now, this was a big improvement. But with this prototype, which they developed in just a few days, they realized many of the people did not finish answering the questions, about 50%. Because they're kind of like, I don't even know what this app does, and it's asking me for my social security number. I don't know. I don't really. I don't feel comfortable with this. So the third prototype was they down, you download the app, snap the photo. It says, congratulations, you're almost done with your taxes. Answer these six questions. And then you, know, you pay to file, e-file. You could do your taxes in 10 minutes or less. One of the, our favorite comments was a gentleman on Valentine's Day date saying, I just did my taxes on Valentine's Day. Best Valentine's Day date ever. And, uh, and now that's awesome, doing your taxes in 10 minutes or less. So that's the spirit of minimum awesome product. Let me just close by talking, saying one word about business models. The big trap in the business model section is applying an old business model, assuming that a business model you've seen out there applies to you. It might, but a lot of times, you're just, this is a picture of a big GM engine with new ideas, this poor little mouse trying to drive the big engine. A lot of times, an old business model can kill your existing, uh, your, your new innovation. So you have to, as Scott talked about, he had to give his team the freedom to explore what's the right business model uh, outside of the way we currently do business. And startup entrepreneurs do this too. They say, oh, I know how this works. And it may work that way for you. But what you want to focus on is, Finding a business model that is capable of supporting your innovation, that is impatient for profit, and that is patient for growth. And we could go into some more detail about how this works. I want to be sensitive to your other classes and just uh, close by saying that, you know, we have seen positive outcomes from applying the innovator's method. If we look at the subsample of public companies that had lost their innovation capabilities and then regained them. What we see is about a 60% gain in their innovation premium, which translated to about, on average, $15 billion in market cap. So this was a big deal. In the uh, companies we studied, you know, Intuit was able to increase their innovation revenue 10x, GE to reduce their time and costs of uh, developing large projects like jet engines, 40%. Hindustan Unilever increased the revenue 40%. Godrej created a new product category. And I'll add that startup entrepreneur after startup entrepreneur who I've met applies these, addresses these elements to really effectively innovate. And I'd just like to say change the world. And my favorite example, that actually comes from pharmaceuticals. If you look at the data, it costs about $4.3 billion to develop a new treatment for companies that have developed three or more. I went and talked to Regeneron. They applied the concepts of the innovator's method to a very complex technical problem, and they're able to develop pharmaceuticals for 0.7, which is less than 20% the industry average. So you have to adapt these ideas to your own unique situation. But as you go out and you test your ideas, don't forget. Try to understand what job you're trying to do. For who? And then use a series of these low-cost prototypes to match the solution to that job to be done and wrap it in a business model that can support your innovation for the long run. Because ultimately, I believe innovation is about solving problems and making the world a better place. So thank you.